Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, and today I'm joined by Chef Ismail Samad. Thank you so much for being here with us. No, cool. Thanks. I'm happy to happy to be on. It's cool. Yeah. Well, you are a man that wears many, many hats and has quite a journey to where you are today. So I'd love to just start off with you telling our audience about yourself and how you how you got to where you are and what all you're kind of working on. Yeah. Um so where I, I guess you have to start with like where am I, right? Like, right. right. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So right now I'm like I just recently moved back to to my hometown of East Cleveland about a, about a year ago, um, and so I was born and raised in East Cleveland. For, spent the last thirteen years over on the East Coast, um, maybe even longer. I can't even remember. I'm not good with dates, um, but um, so I went 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 out east after uh, having my first cafe uh, when I was 23. Uh, here in Cleveland, actually downtown 47 and Lakeside. It was called Crust and Crumbs Cafe. Um, and then after, like during the recession, I was trying to figure out what to do. I had, we had, we were actually going to move into a new location, um, not too far. Actually, it was going to over close to Asia Town, where it is right now on 36th and Superior. Um, and during that time, we had put some money into this into this uh, project. We were going to move it. We had re, re, rebranded to be called The Crumb. And we had a bigger property that we were going to be activating in. And then the recession happened. And then we were like, ah, this is kind of probably not the right thing to do. So we lost some money in that. And then at that point, I was looking to figure out what I was going to do next. And I couldn't find, um, I really couldn't find um, a good chef job that that I wanted to take. There was a couple other things that were like, ah, but it didn't really check the boxes that I needed to. So that led me to kind of like look outside of Cleveland. Um, and that landed me in, in Vermont. But so, yeah, so I went to, um, I went to, uh, went to Vermont at the time we were kind of, I was kind of looking for, to get closer to, to farms. Uh, and that led me to say, man, Vermont seems like a cool spot to be. Um, and then I got my first job at an inn called uh, the Putney Inn. And so I was executive chef there met all the farmers and from there i had launched you know fast forward a little bit after meeting all the farmers um i was like man i want to kind of do something different than just regular farm to table uh because i started to see and and, and really see the opportunity for 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 turning what me in the past, a chef who was like, man, give me the perfect thing. I need my carrots to be like this size. I need my tomatoes to be this teeny. I need my okra, whatever it is to be perfect in order to plate it in the fine dining setting. Um, and I started to witness exactly um, how this was, it was impacting, you know, the farms. And so I remember having a conversation with a farmer friend of mine, uh, Mike Collins uh, from Old Athens Farm. And we were joking around saying, we should open a place called the compostery, right? <laughs> and so we were like, oh, all right, cool. So we started kind of like um, playing around with recipes of stuff and seeing how nimble we needed to be. And then we launched our, our restaurant called The Gleanery. And this was in Putney. And so from The Gleanery, we had, it's still open to this day. I'm still a partner in it. Um, not actively chefing there, obviously. <laughs> um, but it's been open to this day. It's still committed to making sure that you know, we're buying, you know, the first things that we need to be buying from the farmer's perspective, not the first things that we need to be buying from, you know, a chef's like demanding perspective, like, hey, everything must be perfect and excellent. Um, because I can make it perfect and excellent once I get an opportunity to play around with. So it's just flipping it, flipping it around a little bit. So I went from that um, and I moved to Boston um, to help launch uh, a series of nonprofit grocery stores. And those series of non nonprofit grocery stores were um, called Daily Table. And so what we were doing is we were looking at um, we're looking at how to leverage the amount of wasted food um, to create an affordable um, grocer. 
Um, and so we created a commissary kitchen. I came up with all the recipes and nutritional guidelines with the EdMed community of Boston to figure out like what are the what are the benchmarks we need to be looking at as it relates to fiber or or sodium, um, sugar, um, and all these other things that are, were that are, are affecting you know um, under underrepresented communities or impoverished communities, especially communities of color. So that's kind of what our focus. We we did. Um, I was responsible for for. Um, getting the recipe started up, the nutritional guidelines set up, um, getting that going, and of course, getting the supply chains ready um, in order to capture uh, both donate, donated surplus and or deeply discounted products to put into the commissary kitchen to produce ready-made meals that would meet specific health guidelines. Um, and so we did that. Um, so went from there to a... Uh, to a food business incubator. And so food business incubator, we had about, at the time I was, I was running programs there and I ran the pharma value added program. And I also ran the accelerator program that would, that would get um, black, brown and women owned companies into secured purchasing contracts um, with um, the anchor institutions of Boston, like Boston Children's Hospital, um, Boston Medical Center, Harvard and, and MIT to really find some secured uh, pathways of revenue uh, for, um, you know, under-resourced entrepreneurs in the Boston area. Um, so then COVID happened. And so that kind of like really um, destroyed a lot of the efforts that we had, that we had made um, for these entrepreneurs that were really looking at our, our seven, you know, our 20,000 square foot um, shared kitchen um, to come in and, and produce and process and distribute and receive and all the things that it takes. And then of course, farmers would drop off their products into our farmer value added, um, a program that we would then recover. We make applesauce, tomato sauce, um, marinara sauce, um, and other things out and butternut squash puree and all these other things from the surplus that was in the greater Boston area. Um, and so once, that happened, we kind of had to shut down. And once COVID happened, we had to shut down. Like a lot of people had to pivot and figure what we we're gonna do. Um, that's when I started to figure out what I wanted to do um, next. And at that time, my mom was like, man, can you, you know, can you come back home? I wanted to get back home. Um, we had, you know, and it just was a lot of stuff that was coming our way. Like, what is it that I'm doing? And I kind of made the decision, you know, to kind of really come back um, home and be closer to family. And upon thinking about it, it was like, all right, now how can I take what we had been doing over on the East Coast and do it in a way um, with some deliberateness that hadn't been done yet from the city that I'm from, which is East Cleveland. And so East Cleveland um, is often called the, uh, the poorest city in the state. Um, and so what I started to look at is, okay, well, I don't want to look at it from a deficit mindset. What are the assets and resources that we have in the community that we can actually, um, we can move to do um, some sort of economic development projects that are, of course, grounded in, in what I believe in, which is food and sustainability and spatial and environmental justice of owning our space and owning our supply chains and stuff like that. So I said, if we were to do that, we'd have to have secured certain pieces in the supply chain in order to actually deliver on promises of some of the things that we kind of talk about all the time as being, you know, independent from these larger food systems or whatever. So I'm, I'm like, all right, coming back, I said, we need to own land to grow it at grow products in. we need to own a retail place to sell it. And we need to own a product company that is already um, in we need to own a product company that is in a, in a, in a market that, that has a high ceiling. And so we started looking at what are those things. And we looked at tea as a company like herbal tea and honey. Obviously these are things that are never going to go out of style and have been, you know, part of our agribusiness or agriculture and, or um, personal um, consumption um, forever. And you can also do them in a, in a way that, you know, it's a, it's you can do it small scale and you can scale it up and you can actually make decent money even if you keep it at, at a certain scale that's manageable without having to outsource a lot of the manufacturing um almost kind of like investing in ourselves as as farmers mm -hmm. homesteaders in 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 the city and then the other was like wait we need manufacturing we need a company that that's at a scale of manufacturing but the the the, the inputs of, of of a production kitchen could be low 
without having to build out exhaust and all these other things and fermented foods became like, hmm, um, one of the oldest way of actually denaturing and actually preserving product is, is, is fermented food. So we had the opportunity to, um, to purchase Wake Robin Foods. And so then Wake Robin Foods became part of what we're doing within our larger um, organization of Loiter, which is about creating spaces and business opportunities for the people of East Cleveland with um, control over spaces to grow, to transact and to manufacture. And um, also is has our, and we, we were fortunate enough because a product is already in 50 something stores and in two states. So we said, hmm, this is like a, a great move. So that's where we're at right now. Um, so we've got the cafe that's opening in the spring. We've got Wake Robin that will be um, kind of like fueling the menu for that cafe. So you do like bowls and like sandwiches with our product line. Um, and then we, we've got our tea that we grow and our honey that we harvest that will be part of the tea shop cafe. Um, and so that's it. And we do it. We rent, we manage a farmer's market um, every Wednesday. And we're going to do that until the the, the cold kicks us out and then come the spring we'll be ready to launch our full um farmer's market um at our at our three and a half acres that we have um about a about three quarters of a mile up from the cafe so that's what we kind of did in that from one year of like all right i gotta move fast i want to figure out what to do um because the the opportunity is now to really try and um and it's interesting. And I'll say one more thing and I'll stop. Yeah. The interesting thing, what the interesting thing with uh, with with East Cleveland is the barrier to entry is extremely low, right? Property value is so low because of the the undervalued reality of black communities and or poor, just poor under-resourced, habitually excluded communities. Mine happens to be the the uh, majority African American community of of East Cleveland. You can find these realities in rural white spaces and, and indigenous spaces. Um, as it relates to me, I'm from East Cleveland, so I'm speaking in the context of where I'm from. Uh, but any space that's habitually excluded from sound economic opportunity, um, if we can look at these as being resources and not like, you know, oh, I can't wait to get away. We can almost say this is a wonderful opportunity to stay because we can acquire properties for cheap. We can build up from, you know, from a blank slate and we can collectively build that world of, of interdependence and, you know, and sustainability that everybody seems to say is fleeting. It's only fleeting because we're not really committing our collective resources to actually deliver what it is we're looking for. So that's kind of like where we're at. That's like where I, where I, where it was, <laughs> how I got to him and kind of like the, the why behind the work that I do. Oh my gosh. What a, that's amazing. And I, <laughs> I wish everybody thought like you, like the systems thinking of how everything's connected. And even I love how you think of, um, food in such a whole way. Like you said, it's not just about like that perfect, you know, little piece of something and the rest gets thrown away. It's going to be, how do you use the entire thing? And I think Wake Robin really helps you to, again, minimize food waste, preserve in the safest way we know how to preserve in a yeah. way that ups the mineral co or vitamin content of the vegetable that you're preserving. Like, Everything about it is fantastic. And the fact that you said you've done most, like a lot of this in the last year. <laughs> <laughs> I always say every time I talk about you, I'm like, he wears so many hats. But like that just kind of summarizes all everything that you're doing and still doing from Vermont to in Boston. So I just, I think you're incredible. And the work you're doing is so impactful. And I'd love to hear... We're partnering with you. Um, the Chef's Garden is partnering with you on some ferments, which we're so excited about. It's our first time really going to um, have our vegetables fermented and available. And so I'd love to hear from you, like, when it comes to reducing food waste, like, what are the steps that you're taking, like, in your life? And what are steps that, like, our listeners can be taking? Yeah, no, thanks. I'm excited about it, too, because it's like... Um... Trying to, so there, like you said, there's like me as like the chef who's trying to um, be an activist and a doer within this large, you know, reality of food waste, which is um, like the, the, the tonnage is real, right? The impact on the environment is real. Um, and so, and then there's like, what do you do at home and what do you do within it? So I, um, I'm a huge fan of like, um, not just social enterprises, but like enterprises 
um, that, you know, again, like, like as it relates to like, so there's behavior change that I'm interested in as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So at home, we're trying to say, okay, we look, I know, uh, and it's interesting. Now you got your kids who now go to school and I was like, wait, dude, you, you've always, always, always eaten your freaking ends. I know you picked that up from somewhere, right? Because we eat ends in our house. And so the fact now that I know you're coming home, not eating your ends because you're kind of seeing somebody else who doesn't really appreciate that there's nutrients in that. And, yeah. you know, and so anyway, so it's just interesting about how, 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 how pressures um, of our peers, even at the young, from, from young to old, like kind of can inform how we're moving, even if we, as, as parents or, or whatever are, are trying to instill like, you know, these certain uh, pieces of, of, you know, just like sustainability, this, this ideology of, of sustainability into our children. Um, and so like that behavior change is what I'm interested in. And I, and I don't, and I'm trying to figure out ways to say, if, if you go to like, for instance, at the restaurant, it's, it's up to me as the chef to be more flexible and nimble with the farmer, right? Because I am an artist, right? I'm a culinary artist, right? So there is this, right. this art form that should make way for creativity to be expressed. So I want to hold on to like, kind of like the canvas of creativity, which is the restaurant. And I want to be informed by the raw materials that I get, no matter what they are, right? So that's kind of how I'm, how I'm thinking about it. If I can't make, you know, something unbelievably you know tasty and that wows my customers out of a like wrangly wrinkled leaf then I kind of like suck right and so that's <laughs> how I look at it so um so there's that and then there's the the whole thing around like wordplay um we came up with the word gleanery because I mentioned compostery is just like yeah it's kind of uh, can't do it gleanery we're like okay well, it's a space of gleaning what is gleaning you're gathering information bit by bit you're really trying to to, to, to figure this thing out, right? So it's not just about food, but it's also like this kind of like the systemic view of what it is. And even when we did daily table, we began to look at just saying wasted food um, is different than saying um, food waste, mm. right? So it's like, because if you say food waste, that means you're already telling you that it's, 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 it's food and it's waste. But if you say something that is wasted food, that means you're putting the the the, the you're putting the, the the emphasis on that it is food, and that we're wasting food, right? So I think so. It's just again, understanding that how do we, because the majority of the food that is wasted in this country it happens at home, right? Um, yeah. And so it would be nice to figure out ways for um, for us to to collectively. Um, eat differently at home and, and learn to preserve and, and get closer to the land and, and, and growing food and knowing how to preserve it. But I, it could be in the freaking freezer or freaking save, you know, yeah. saver. it doesn't have to be um, fermented, but fermented food, like you said, is the oldest way. And it adds so much health to it along the way. So it has this, this has so much benefit to the fermentation to, to actually um, fermenting. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. And that's, I think, you know, for me, it just adds that like complexity and like a new flavor um, by fermenting vegetables. And they're so versatile. Like you can keep them in your refrigerator and put them on just about everything and anything. Um, and yeah. it is something that my kids will eat too, which is really nice. Um, they I can know. be picky sometimes, but how do you like, I know you mentioned children. How do you, what do you do as far as, um, <laughs> your daughter and like fermented foods and food waste. And like, what are some of the tips you might give other parents too around that? And I know yeah. it's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's hiding it, right? No, it's like yeah. hiding the stuff, hiding it in it. Um, like putting that stuff in stir fries, right? Um, yeah. Like kimchi stir fries. We do like, you know, like uh, we put it like kimchi and eggs is super tasty, putting it on a grilled cheese you know, putting in a freaking mac and cheese, right? It's good, right? Like kimchi mac, you know what I mean? Just, yeah. just stuff like this, like, because the kids, they actually like the flavor, right? Um, right? And so what, 
and my, my like I'm, I'm lucky like they you know they love pickles right they like yeah they like it so I think it's introducing early I think someone at my a friend of mine said I, I can't remember the amount of times but I think it's like you have to give a child you know a, a product you know an item of something new to eat I think it's like 13 times before they actually um you know can can register as something that they either like or don't like so just because they're 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 still figuring it out when they taste it the first time the brain has to register if there's if it's going to trigger something else um but but my 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 whole thing is like i just want to like have if we're fortunate enough to where we we do have a garden outside we've got chickens we've got bees so they see food all around them in its in its natural state Right. Mm -hmm. And so if ever we do go out and we go to to a grocery store and we get something that's prepackaged, there's already a distinction like, okay, there is this prepackaged stuff. And then there's like the food that we grow. Right. And so making sure that diversity lives within the household makes it to where we don't get put we don't get set in our norm or what's normal. Right. And so if you just only have you know, pre-made, you know, processed foods in the, in the house, um, then it becomes like an accepted reality when you get older. So I think diversifying what's in the home, um, what, what, what they see as being, Hey, we're not eating that today, go out and pick some freaking tomatoes and we'll make a salsa. Oh, okay, cool. It's fine to get, you know, the, the salsa sometimes, but in when it's in season, we're going to lose all of those tomatoes. Yeah. So go out and get them. We're going to put them in jars. Um, and we're going to have fun while doing it. So it creates this, you know, when you, when you can actually have, you know, the space to grow, um, you know, it just makes it easier. And then I'm also somebody that says everybody does have the space to grow. You just got to find it. I don't care if it's your porch in an apartment, right? You can do planters, you can do um, community gardens. You can. It's just a, a mindset of wanting to be a wanting to create that kind of diversity in, in your home of where food's coming from. Because then your kids will go. Though they they're gonna we're gonna rebel and choose when they get older anyway. <laughs> um, and so if they know how they were raised, but me. Like it took a while, like I grew up eating dinner, you know, at the table at my mother and father's house, right. With all of our, our brothers and sisters around the table. So that sticks with me. Um, and so same difference with, you know, I, I hope that, you know, um, my girls are the same way when they say, oh, you know what, my, my daddy always, you know, had, you know, uh, freaking apple butter or salsa or canned pears or whatever it is that we're doing because there's a memory attached to it. Yeah, I love that. And I love like bringing your family into teaching those basic skills. And I feel like across the board, we're not teaching a lot of that anymore um, to kids as they grow up, like the basic preservation and gardening and like all the things I love. And I love that you bring up like you really can grow at least something regardless of where you live, whether it's a container or on a windowsill, like there's so much potential. And I kind of feel like if you're successful in doing it once, it kind of becomes a little bit addicting. And maybe this is just a personal (laughs) problem, but (laughs) I feel like it builds that you're like, oh, I tried this and it worked really good. Next year I might do two things, you know, like, um, and then before you know it, you don't have any grass left and your whole yard is a garden. So, (laughs) but, um, I think, like teaching your kids early, like is so amazing and getting them involved. And like our kids too, we had a garden out back in Wisconsin and we used to tease, like if we weren't really in the mood to make lunch, we'd just be like, go on out back. Like there's plenty (laughs) right, right, you know, and they just graze around and try everything. And it was fun. But I do think there's that seasonality that's really important too. And can you speak to like how, how you as a chef and you as a father are using like seasonal produce um, and kind of the importance there. Yeah. So you talk about the garden snacks, right? So the other day we had, I was bringing, talking with um actually Mark from Riddall actually came through um, and we were, had a little snack um, in the garden. I t- took a nasturtium leaf, you know, a mint leaf and a cherry tomato. Right. And so that it was just like, you know, peppery, minty, tomato. And we were just eating that as a combo. So just understanding like, like when you can walk through the fields and you can just grab like, you know, just taste these different things. 
Um, that kind of like right from the plant um, snacking is really fun to do with the girls too. And the girls can go out and they can identify, you know, just wild edibles and just plant it because it, it just becomes part of, because kids are curious. So even stuff you're not growing, they'll want to go, why can't we eat that? So they just start to ask the questions and, and things like that. But the seasonality is, um, is, uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm, that's like it. Like, I'm, I'm like, I, that's a cheater question because like, I, like I was, you know, I was ra- you know, like number one, I was raised by parents. Again, like I said, like we did, we, there was no wasting in our family and it was like, Hey, what, you know, so very resourceful. Um, and then you then go to culinary school, right. And you work under um, the chefs who are saying, Hey, look, everything must be this way. So there's this, this other level there. Now I'm, I'm older now. Uh, and I'm like, well, chefs are kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> there's this interesting <laughs> thing. Like I, I, I'm, I'm like, man, am I a chef? I think I am. I, but I also, there's this other like shrouded, like a uh, negative uh, connotation that I have as it relates to, to chef, because like my experience wasn't super great. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, <laughs> but Um, but as it relates to the seasonality, that's what I took from it. So I took from the good. Right. And so that good was like understanding, like everything, you know, look, not just the seasonal, but like the whole, the whole fruit or vegetable, right. The leaf, the stem, right. The root, right. The seed, you know, understanding like all of it. Um, let's, let's play around with it. And so I'm kind of like right now, what are we eating right now? Like I said, right now, we're just trying to like, um, what's coming out right now is we're transitioning. We're trying, well, we haven't got a frost yet. So we're still Mm -hmm. getting some peppers. We're still getting, um, you know, our tomatoes are still on there. Obviously we're about to play around with the green tomatoes. I'm about to do, I've never done fermented green tomatoes. And I, and and, and my friend recently sent me a a link and he was like, man, you should try these. So I'm going to try to do some fermented green tomatoes. And you can't do the firm. You can't do fermented red tomatoes without them actually, turning into some version of alcohol because there's so much sugar in the, in the red tomatoes, but um, not to say you couldn't then let that turn into, you know, a tomato vinegar down the road, but it, it's, it keeps going. Right. So, yeah. but I do want to try the, uh, the, the fermented, fermented green tomatoes, and then we could put the, the cabbage and corn and things like that and do the chow chow. Um, but so there's a couple of things that I'm going to play around with um, right now. Um, especially since now I'm in this fermented space. So I'm like, all right, what, what, what are all the things I can, I can kind of put into a jar and, and, uh, and see, and then scale it up, um, and then get it, you know, to be, you know, you know, like, oh, we did, we did those, that asparagus, right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it turned out great. And I've, I've got some in the fridge too. And I just ate some a couple, uh, okay. a couple weeks ago. They turned out, they turned out really good. They were really fat ones that we, that, that, that we were with Jamie and he picked and they yeah. turned out and they're still super crunchy. Um, and they're, they're really good. Oh, good. That's, I was going to yeah. ask you, like, as far as like unusual vegetables to ferment, I know you mentioned green tomatoes, which sounds really fascinating and I can't wait to try that asparagus is there anything else like unusual especially when it comes to like waste reduction not necessarily for wake robin that like but that you have found that you can ferment that is really <laughs> like fun or interesting yeah so not just with ferments but it's just like utilizing everything that 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 we can so whether it's fermented or preserved in some way or or you're looking at okay it's something like brines i'm into i'm really into brines using yeah. the brines of the ferments after i get all the the solids out you know using those those brines to marinate using those as a base for a vinaigrette um cool. like we did so i'll give an example we made we did a um we did a hot sauce a fermented hot sauce um, so from that fermented hot sauce, then we added things to it. Like, so we had different versions of it. So we said, okay, we've got this master mother sauce, which is just the fermented onions and garlic and jalapenos and other stuff. And we grinded that all up, pureed all that up. And then we went to the garden and said, oh, cool, shoot, we got to throw some cilantro on this one. This one will have like, you know, chives and this, 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 this is one version of a hot sauce. This one is going to be like mint and this, 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 this. So it's like this, we've got these different flavored hot sauce, you use the same base. And then you had some more left over, then you make, use the, the small leftover, which I think it was like, maybe like, like eight ounces 
of, uh, no, I think it was like four, like four ounces of, uh, of, of hot sauce, fermented hot sauce that we had left. And then we turned that into a, a spicy vinaigrette, right? So just from that, we had like all these other things we could do it. And so now you've got this kind of like this catalog of things that came from that one mother um, batch. Um, so thinking in, in batches allows you to be way more creative. And so same difference when you buy, like we, I have this recipe for a, you know, just like olive brine chicken or olive brine uh, beef or something like that. You take that same, you take the olive brine, you, you kind of marinate it overnight, you put your herbs in it. So you don't, you don't pour the, the olive brine down the drain, right? So you're getting as much flavor because somebody already kind of like did that work. You might as well capture what you can out of it. And that olive brine chicken is really tasty, like with some harissa and tomatoes and stuff like that. And you sling it in the oven with some dates or if you want to, but like the, it's, oh my God, it's, you're blowing my mind. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, that is amazing. Yeah. so like stuff like that is like really fun to do. And so it's trying to say like, I don't do re- like I do recipes, but I do like yeah. more like inspired by what's in the fridge. Like what yeah. needs to be used up. If we think about it from that, from that perspective, um, we can then waste less and you can have more fun. It's like that daily challenge of like, hmm, what trouble can I get into today? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I got to use up. You know? Right. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. And I think that's so smart. Like using the end of the brine, like from a ferment as a marinade or as a vinaigrette. And that's, I mean, yeah. you always have that little it's leftover. Yeah. And fantastic. usually I'll like stuff some more vegetables back in there <laughs> and try to get like another round out. But like yeah. to use it as a brine or a marinade is genius. I oh, love man. that. It's so good. If you take that last bit of kimchi and then you, so, and then you, you basically, you can put, you know, some, some you, you marinate your chicken in there, right. Then you cook your chicken and then you cook yeah. down that, that sauce with some tomatoes and stuff like that. So now it becomes a sauce and you pour it right on top. It's like, it's, it's such a, it's just a nice, like funky, flavorful um, chicken dish. That's real easy to do. And you don't have to do much because like you said, you got the jar and, and one, th- and so we'll even pour them into like, okay, cool. We just take it from one jar and keep going and we'll, we'll have a whole nother jar. And then that's when we'll do the larger batch. Oh, cool. So we're not just putting a little bit of vegetables in it. So you're collecting the fermented juice. So then you could then just put more, you can have a larger batch of the vegetables that you're putting in. Cause like you, you're, you're right to say like, man, sometimes you just take the vegetables, but then it's just like, dang, it's just kind of like more flavorful. It's not really, but, but it's yeah. good to kind of like continue to collect the stuff. So because it doesn't it, it's it's just it's, plus it's just fun to play around with stuff yeah oh my gosh and the olive brine too that's i'm like that's so smart because i yeah. my kids love olives and i do i pour it out all the time so yeah 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 i think finding those ways to reduce waste and like you said using what's in your refrigerator because again that's where most of the waste is coming from is our homes and so yeah being able to work not necessarily from a recipe and that's what we hear a lot of times people wanting is like how do i like how do i use this i need a recipe right and i think you're talking more from like that creative place of like trusting some of your like intuition or instinct into like hey let's just try let's be creative let's like let's experiment right yeah and it's also accepting like it, it it goes to like, if you're growing food, sometimes you don't even need recipes. Literally, it's just grabbing a bunch of stuff, slinging it into the bowl, taking your 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 kimchi or your your olives or whatever, and putting it together and eating. And it's very tasty. What chefs do is not like sometimes I think we overthink like the recipe game, mm-hmm. and we we did, like the food it is already so tasty. Like you like some like. Recipes are great, but it, uh, they can be crippling because then you end up with this inertia that you're trusting on some, some, some like all knowing chef to tell you what to do. <laughs> it's, right. it's kind of like, like, man, like literally like you have everything you need to make something tasty. Like that's where I'm at. And it's just, you know, just putting it together in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Some of the best vegetable dishes I have, I have ever like had are really just like the true essence of the vegetable, right? Just yeah. letting that like vegetable sing. And I love like one of um, Dan Barber's recipes for the 898 squash I was recently doing was literally just roast the heck out of the squash and put some olive oil and some salt on it. And yeah. it's delicious. Like you don't need <laughs> butter. You don't need like much yeah. of any, or you don't need, um, what is it? Brown sugar or maple syrup, yeah. like right. just a little bit of butter and you're good. And I'm like, 
God, that it tastes so good and you do so little. Like it yeah. almost feels wrong, right? But yeah. I think sometimes it's letting that vegetable like like the the truest expression or like the truest flavor of the vegetable itself can sometimes be the best. No, exactly. Especially when you're talking about stuff like squash and things like that. There's first off, there's so much sugar in them already. Like you don't yeah. need, like if you slowly roast these things, right? Like the, like a slowly roasted um, squash is so tasty. Like I'm like, and you put some, some, some grains inside of a delicata squash that was roasted for freaking like an hour and, and, and an hour and 40 minutes, you know, on yeah. 275 is like <laughs> so good. Um looking at like yeah like salt pepper oil a lot of times with some with some vegetables goes it goes a long way now now the heat matters right the yeah. the time that you cook it now there's some technical aspects into it but a lot of times most chefs um that I've worked with or that I actually like hang out with if I don't hang out with any chefs but those <laughs> that I'm still connected to um it, like again it's like simple um simple techniques understanding that, that that understand what type of heat to use is it a moist heat a dry heat is a long a, a fast heat you know a slow heat mm -hmm. um those are the things that really can like um you know really you know get let you know what flavor profile you're going to get out of them yeah oh, i love that so our podcast is called farming for health and when you envision like farming for health what does that look like to you um Farming for health, what does it look like? So I think it's like, when I hear it, um, it's almost like a, um, I guess it's a matter of fact thing, right? Because if you're farming, it will be healthy, right? There's no, it's like, no, there's no contradiction there. It's not something that you can get away from. Um, but then you have to, you have to define what type of farming that you're doing. And then there's like, you know, uh, I guess I'd re I'd answer your question with the questions. What type of farming are you talking about? I can say <laughs> some some people farm for profit. Some people farm uh, for um, you know for subsidy. <laughs> some right. people farm for industry, or or some people are are even paid not to farm. You know, uh, because of the attachment to subsidy and all of these other things that are very complex. We're talking about GDP and things like that. So. If you're saying farming for health, it's like, hey, you know what? I got dirt, <laughs> I got some water, and I got some seeds, and I got love, and I got care. And you know what? Doing this, you're going to, you know, the outcome will be healthy. So that's kind of where my brain comes at it. Unless you're like somebody who's like manipulating the, the language, you're like, hey, guess what? We're just gonna say we're farming for health, but actually it's just some like ridiculously road, like monocrop reality. Out right. <laughs> that's that's like so. But so I, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, yeah. No, I think that's a great answer, and I think there is so much variation there, and I feel like any more farming has become kind of nuanced, right? In your question. Yeah is really legit like what are what are you talking about and like i guess i would say like oh, is all farming healthy i don't you know i don't yeah no it's, i know i it's a very interesting thing it's yeah. a very but i do like the the the, the notion that, that 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 is there of and you mentioned it before like and we talked about it before around like the no matter the amount of space um, that you have, if you're growing your food, there's going to be a, a deeper connection to food. Mm -hmm. um, and so because there's a deeper connect, deeper connection to food, um, uh, you could make an assumption that you'll have a healthier outcome. And so that gets to this whole place of like farming for health. And so that's, that's kind of what I think about it. Yeah, I love that. And as somebody who I think, at least from like observing you, I think you have a lot of passion and like love for your community and love of food. Like, how does that role of like the love and the care that you put into like the preparation of the food, how does that translate or how does that like um, kind of come into your work? And then how do you experience and how do other people experience that? So I've been... <sighs> No, it's a very, that's a great question. I've been, I'm at this point where I just want, 
I don't like talking about problems, right? I like just moving and doing stuff. And I like doing stuff with people that get it. And I like people uh, to collaborate with me on, um, on, on action steps. Um, we can figure out all the details later. Um, it's almost like um, we keep tripping over ourselves. And so for me, when I came back to East Cleveland, when I came back home, I didn't want to, I did not want to do like an urban farming program, right? And I, I wanted to create like a, a pathway for urban farms to be able to be in partnership with rural farms in a way that, that we haven't been able to do. Uh, because the moment we start, and this is going to get very big because I think in system, food systems, I'm a food system thinker. Um, but when I look at how the, how the money has been deployed into, um, uh, into the urban ag space, it hasn't, in my opinion, it hasn't generated um, a, um, a, tr a clear pathway to developing urban farmers on land that's owned by people, not organizations. Whereas um, in rural spaces, the land is owned by people, right? And the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in those majority, right? And those people um, are like the heroes of the community. Like you, you do the pick your own, you kind of like go visit the farmer, you know their family, you pet their animals. Um, you can just sit in your car and look at the stars, like whatever it is that you that happens in these rural spaces, the, the superheroes, so to speak, are the farmers. Um, and I want to do something similar to that. Like it's like, and so, and I'm starting with the land, um, land access, uh, because that's one of the best forms of investment you can make is investing in land. And so if you control the land, you can then control what you grow. And you can create an, uh, you can have the autonomy to do what you want on your land. And if that, and if what you want to do is aligned with what the community needs are, which is, which is in this case, food access, then you're the ones who become that superhero too, who are, you're not waiting on, you know, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company or, you know, the big, you know, um, you know, medical institutions to, to keep fixing the problem, right? When literally there is resources right in front of us and it just takes us to be able to farm it for health. There you go. There's all yeah, that to say, there. There you go. There's, <laughs> there's land in that plane. So it's kind of like getting connected to the land in order to do it. And so that's kind of how I move. And I kind of, um, when we did the gleanery, it wasn't just about me as a chef. It was like the, the previous, previous owners were there they left. And what we said is, if you want another Cisco truck restaurant coming to your community, it's a town of 2000 people um, in Putney, um, then you know what, that's fine. But what we're about is trying to get collective buy in into what it is we're trying to do. It's not just about me. It's about the farmers who are your neighbors. It's about the artisans that are building the tables. It's about the potters who are, who are making the pottery that you're eating out of. And so we went out to the community and, and asked people to invest in that entire ecosystem of what it takes to build a community owned establishment. And when it's community owned, that means you've got investment by the people and you've got products and goods that are made by the community as well. And so it's getting that collective buy-in to build out this, 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 this restaurant, which is the greenery. And so I'm always looking to engage, to, to, to try and engage with what the needs are and then getting a collective approach to kind of saying, hey, this is, it takes a village to kind of do this stuff and let's have fun doing it. And so I tr try and take the back seat, you know, on some of this stuff because it's really, you know, I try not to make it about me. It's really about what the needs are of the community are. And so what we're doing with Loiter is like, hey, look, if there's no grocery store um, in East Cleveland, and if there, if somebody the other day was like, oh, look, I'm gonna come to East Cleveland and have, have some coffee. And I texted them back, I was like, okay, cool. Meet me at McDonald's to go to the McCafe. And they're like, no, I need to go somewhere else. I said, no, there is no coffee shop in East Cleveland. There is so, if you want coffee, you're gonna come to my house. We're gonna go to McCafe and McDonald's. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll come to your house. Okay, there's, so you know, there's level set. So you know what we're doing. So, but there's no, the amenities that are in the city 
um, need to be addressed. So what I'm trying to do is like, I don't want to, I didn't want to be somebody who, who, who owns a, a, a coffee shop or a tea shop or a cafe. It's not as fun. It's not really what I'm like, oh my God, I want to make the bomb sandwich. But what's needed in this community is a place for people to come in and grab, you know, an affordable bite, a space of conviviality and uh, uh, an engine of, of, of purchasing from farmers that we're beginning to invest in, in East Cleveland and that, and from companies that are owned by the people that are here in Wake Robin and Colvin Sweet Creamery and Food Depot Health or these, some of these other people that pieces that are going to be a part of that ecosystem building within the cafe. So it's like looking at the current needs and then putting a, putting a product, a product or a project out there that um, people from the community and from outside can rally behind and say, man, I want to go to that cafe, not only because guess what, freaking like um, freaking smoke cheddar, you know, pickle brine chicken and daggone kimchi pickle panini sandwich is freaking bomb. And you're telling me that when I buy it, it's going to be affordable and it's going to support the local growers. And then I can get a cup of tea that was grown from around the corner from, 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 from Mrs. Samad, who has like a small apiary and tea beds and she's growing tea and it's dehydrated. Oh man, my dollars are actually supporting the creation of the circular economy. That's amazing. But all of that doesn't matter if it's not super tasty. So as a chef, I'm like, Hey, look, we're going to ensure that is convivial and it's amazing and that your experience is going to be something that you're going to tell your neighbors to come to East Cleveland to say this is the destination and we don't need the Starbucks or the uh, Panera as we need the smaller local entities that can become the celebrated businesses of, of Northeast Ohio that are really the economic drivers of creating this kind of food economy that it's needed in these in the especially in, in the state of Ohio like now I'm getting into like this other space of like the, I love the purple reality of, of, uh, of, of Ohio, meaning like the red and the, and the blue, like, again, that the Democrat Republic, I, I love the, 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 the clear tension and the clear um, democratized reality of both sides of Ohio, because it, it, it means that we have to have these conversations um, with these different spaces. And so I, I like, being in that kind of space. So the farming community is like always so like, oh, it's, which way do we lean? And look, I don't know. It's about, it's literally, it's about like freaking resources and access. And that's what we're talking about, resources and food access. And so um, that's kind of how I look at it. I, I like to have the real conversations about what needs to happen and who's really about problem solving and who's about like keeping status quo realities. If you're about status quo, you might want to talk to somebody else. <laughs> um, but if you're about like disruption and having fun, um, I'm, I'm open like to, to doing that stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. And I love <laughs> like your solution focused, um, kind of personality and like how you work. And that's a while back I saw on a, on a wall that's a, a sign in a center for innovation that I was in. And it said, um, think big or wait, think big, start small. No, think big, move fast, start small. Yeah, yeah. And I, ever yeah, since then, yeah. I was like, I just love that, and nice. it really sounds like what you're doing is like get the ball rolling, get people engaged, and I feel like that sense of community and com community building is something we lack so desperately, especially after COVID. I think a lot of people feel very alone or separated, and so yeah. bringing people into the community and having them involved in it, I think, just creates so much power and. You know, I think the investment, like I, I'm from Wisconsin and, you know, up there we had like a local food group. And again, it was one of those things where we saw like with real numbers and real food, like the more people buying from local farmers, the more local farmers wanted to sell locally instead of right. ship their stuff out to the cities, you know? And so it really um, was very circular and it just, it builds the momentum. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, for sure. Yeah. Sure. So I know our listeners are going to want to find you. Where can our listeners go online to find more about you and Wake Robin and Loiter? Um, so no, so we, so I'm this, this winter, I'm going to be in Boston, like probably on, like 
like back and forth. So in Boston, I'm actually opening in, a, in, a, in the process of opening a market in Boston called Nubian Markets. And Nubian Markets is the celebration of the African African diaspora of food. And so we've got a, uh -huh. a marketplace and a cafe and a butcher shop, a halal butcher shop that's opening there. It's a 7,000 square foot space in Nubian Square, the newly named Nubian Square, which used to be called Dudley Square. So that's opening this, this winter. Um, COVID um, made the delay happen and now we have to open in like the worst time possible in the winter time, but the burn rate is real, real and we got to get open. So, um, <laughs> so that is Nubian markets that's opening. Um, that's my latest venture. That's not, it's not attached to, to what lawyers doing. Um, but I, I was doing that in Boston before I decided to move. Um, and I'm excited about that because the goal is to bring a Nubian markets into East Cleveland, um, because like, as I mentioned before, th th there is no grocery store and East Cleveland is 90, over 93% African American. So to be able to create like that space of celebrating black hospitality in East Cleveland would be awesome. And to be able to have that be as an economic engine to purchase from other um, farmers that are in Northeast Ohio. Um, would be great and have growers grow things that are, are that are relevant to the community to move people into healthier choices with foods that they can identify with is what we're doing with Nubian Markets. Um, and so that you can find on Instagram, Nubian Markets. Um, my, I'm, I mean, we, we have a podcast, Loiter has a podcast as well called Loitering and Unarmed, uh, where we, me and Jamal Collins, who is another East Clevelander, um, there are two people from East Cleveland talking about um, just a change in in what 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 is often called the poor city of East Cleveland, the poor city of Ohio. Um, and so like on the ground, like real talk around like, all right, this is what systemic racism is. This is what displacement and erasure is. This is what we're up against. How do we develop knowing that, you know, we've got all of this work to do? and have fun while doing it and be honest and vulnerable about the challenges and not oversell it and say, Hey, look, we don't know what we're freaking doing. We just kind of like are here doing what we do with the talent that we have and the research we have. And so that um, you can find us on, I think, yeah, we're, we're on Apple and Google and uh, Spotify as well. So we got that podcast going you can go to, you can go to loiter.us to find that as well. And loiter is that ecosystem of, of businesses that are all about, um, enterprise-based activism and Wake Robin is one of those enterprises. And so right now, if you went to Wake Robin, because we just got it, bought it, we just acquired it about two and a half months ago, three months ago, um, you'd go on there and you wouldn't even see my face because I haven't even changed the website. So it's like, oh man, Pat and Molly still on the thing, but trust me, it is ours. Um, and Pat and Molly. So the website is there. Um, and then, so, and on Instagram is Loiter East Cleveland. Um, yeah, so that's kind of me. Like, I'm just kind of in a lot of different spaces, having fun, doing the best that I can, uh, you know, with cool people, you know, like I gotta, you know, like I like working with people who, who, who get, who, who just get it right. Like we are talking about food, you know, we're talking about opportunity. We're talking about yeah. in a space, in a space of love and vulnerability, we're talking about it, you know, in a way that can be equitable for, for all communities and, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. So every, I think that's it. So you can go to Wake Robin Foods. You can go, you can find Wake Robin in like every single Heinen's. You can find us at, at Whole Foods. You can find us at Lucky's. Um, just, just talk to them. Going to be at um, in Marks. Oh, not, awesome! No, no, not Marks. Dave's. Dave. Okay, Dave. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're trying to get into Marks. Um, but we are in Lucky's, but not Mark. So we're trying to get in, in there. Yeah. Um, and then a couple other, we just, you know, if you're in out in Peninsula, you, we're, we're going to be at the Purple Brown store. So all these other smaller uh, farm stores that we're, we're trying to get into. And then you can come to our farmer's market on Wednesdays and pick it up direct. You get it. You actually, you can get it for cheaper if you come to East Cleveland, you know, because you don't have to pay for the distribution, but, you know. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> So that, that's kind of, yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. It has been so awesome talking with you. Thank you so much for being on with me today. Any final words you want to leave our audience with? No, I don't think so. I think, I think that's it. I think, um, let me see. I didn't ask you any questions. I would, I would, I want to ask you any questions. <laughs> All right. What, what was the coolest thing you picked up from this conversation? Let's just say. I have to say the tips about the 
brine are stuck in my head, like and okay. the olive juice. But I really think um, that creative cooking is something that sticks with me and something that resonates just because I get so many questions about like, how do I, how do I, what recipe do I follow? You know, that sort of thing. And so yeah. kind of learning, um, learning to trust yourself and use what you have. But I also think just one of the things I think I most admire about everything you're doing is that you're like one person that is starting like this huge, like snowball effect, right? Like it's crazy the impact of one person, like in like it's incredible, and you're having such an exponential impact, right? And so I think it's just really inspiring to see like the impact you're having and how you're able to connect so many people and all of the things you're doing with like the passion of really just making making the area you grew up in like that much more like um sustainable and you know connected and a place that people want to stay and come back to and i think and equitable you know like all all of the things but i just i am amazed and impressed at you know you are one one person in a community doing all of this so i just well no well i will say now i'll say one last thing yeah, yeah. Look, you're, you're, <laughs> look, you're 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 in it with me right so it's like yeah. other people it's, it's definitely like a host of people who are doing it. and it takes like people like you who are saying hey look awesome cool let's move right same mm -hmm. same with pat from wake robin hey you know what cool yes let's move right veronica yeah. from uh, food depot to hell cool let's move so there is this it, it, I'm just, I like to stay in the space. I, this is what I'll say. I'll take my roses in this way. I'll say, I like to be in the space of inquiry. I like to ask the tough questions. I like to know, like, like you said, what, are, what if this is the data we got, I'm not going to get into like some sort of like analysis paralysis and be like, um, 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 all right, cool. Enough data. All right, cool. Can we do this? Yes or no? Yeah. The answer is no. That's all right. I'm going somewhere else, right? Hey, remember we talked about X? Are we still there? Yeah, we are. So nothing moved. All right, can we try it now? All right, yes, cool. I, you know what I mean? It's like, because yes. most of the time, we, every all of us kind of like are doing way too much anyway, especially in the food system. None of us mm -hmm. have the solutions because we're just so like, like beat up by this large industrialized reality that we have to some come to, even if we don't want to. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, dang, like I opened my refrigerator the other day and I actually know uh, Jamal, we were doing the podcast and we were like, what? I can't believe you're eating those oats. And I was like, look, I can eat <laughs> I want a Quaker oats. And he was like, oh, don't you get the, the, the oats from the farm? And I was like, oh, I know. So but it's like, so it's like those sorts of things. It's like, we all like want to get better. And it's just hard to like have that kind of sovereignty that we want. Um, right. Because like, it's such a powerful force that's pushing against like small farms, small business and small manufacturing. And then, so it it is a collect collective, it, it, you know. So it's not just me. Thank yeah. you for for acknowledging, but it is a lot of us who are just trying to work and fight and and figure out what what can happen. And you know, and I like to have fun and create tasty food in the process. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful way to end. So yeah. <laughs> thank you again. I think you know it's so worth following you on Instagram too. I follow you, and I love everything you're posting and i think nice. you know people need to come up check out loiter check out wake robin the ferments are so good and i know we've brought up pat and molly a couple times pat was a physician and his daughter molly started wake robin which is a fermentation company using um local-ish vegetables um and and now you are the proud owner of wake robin and your team and they're all incredible and so i think you know, being able to work with you guys has really been delightful. So, yeah. yeah but, same. yes. So, yeah. I hope that thank people will check out everything you're working on. And thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.